welcome to In the Envelope, a podcast from Backstage, the one-stop shop for actors and creators both above and below the line. I am your host, Vinny Mancuso, Backstage Senior Editor and Professional Entertainment Obsessive. I'll be your guide through every corner of the creative industry with the help of some of your favorite stars. Here you'll find intimate, in-depth talks with today's most award-worthy names in film, television, and theater. Along the way, we'll get advice on living your best creative life, relatable stories of the highest highs and lowest lows, and maybe, just maybe, a rare peak in the envelope. trying to be like other people, trying to kind of conform, uh, then you're not going to find that path. You're not going to find the thing that's going to set you on your own because the thing that's going to set you on your own is to be different. And to be different means you have to find a way to not compare yourself or not try to please people or not try to do what everybody likes. Hello, welcome to yet another episode of In the Envelope. I am your host, as always, Vinny Mancuso, and joining me today is someone who I don't think needs too much of an introduction, considering he's an integral part of the biggest movie franchise ever. I'm talking, of course, about the Marvel Cinematic Universe, the MCU, and I'm talking, of course, about the Winter Soldier himself, Sebastian Stan. Now, to be clear, we talked about much, much more than the MCU. Uh, This is some real masterclass acting nerd stuff. This not only gives you an idea of how this guy creates characters, how he approaches every single script with a fine-tooth comb. Really, we covered his entire acting arc from his college days at Rutgers, which is his alma mater and mine, funny enough, all the way through Marvel and up to his recent work on both Pam and Tommy and Fresh. If you haven't seen Fresh yet, you must. Just please do not eat while you do so. Uh, You can thank me later for that piece of advice. Uh, But first, check out this conversation. It's a good one. I'm biased, but I'm pretty sure this is a great conversation. Uh, Let's just get into it. Here is Sebastian Stan. This podcast is, of course, brought to you by Backstage, the number one source for actors looking to get cast. That is probably you. If you're listening to In the Envelope, there's a pretty good chance you're an actor searching for your next gig. Friends, wonderful listeners, I've got some good news. Backstage is offering 30 days free just for you, our In the Envelope audience. 30 days, totally free. I'm a podcast host. I don't do math, but I do know 30 days for $0 is a pretty good deal. All you gotta do is head over to backstage.com slash subscribe and enter the code word envelope at checkout and boom, you have access to thousands of casting notices posted and updated every day. It's all totally filterable. Are you bilingual? Can you dance? Can you juggle? There's probably a gig in there for you somewhere. Just upload a headshot, start applying, and get that dream going. A lot can happen in 30 days, trust me, but first, you gotta subscribe. Get to it. Sebastian Stan is one of the most versatile movie stars working today. In 2011, he officially joined the Marvel Cinematic Universe as Bucky Barnes, better known as the Winter Soldier, a role he's returned to nine times and counting. In between his franchise blockbuster work, Stan has proven himself a ferocious character actor, putting in scene-stealing performances in I, Tanya, Destroyer, the cannibal thriller Fresh, and as real-life rocker Tommy Lee in Hulu's Pam and Tommy. Here is the great Sebastian Stan. How are you doing? How's it going today, sir? Good. How are you? Good. Uh, It's such a pleasure to have you here. And it is uh, especially a pleasure personally for me because this is the first time I've ever had to uh, host a fellow Rutgers alum. So welcome. Uh, I am currently broadcasting from New Jersey as we speak. No way. Wow. New Brunswick? Yeah. Uh, I'm not in New Brunswick now, but I am from New Brunswick. Yeah. So I basically grew up on Rutgers campus. Uh, I was just there, actually, because my, my parents live in New Brunswick. And it's uh, it's kind of crazy. It, it looks 
It looks almost like a real school these days. There's there's new buildings and new clock towers and all that. It's a great place. Great experience. Definitely uh, shaped a lot of my path, I guess you could say. This is the Backstage Podcast. I can't wait to talk about all the current projects, Pam and Tommy, uh, and everything after that. But we do love the journey. We love, we love how you got here. And I guess since that's where we are, we can start there. Because not everyone goes the, the collegiate academic path. So I'm wondering for you, when you think back on that time, when you think back on New Brunswick, New Jersey, what is that sort of kernel of pure acting school advice that, that was true? That, was, that is still, to this day, sort of, you're like, okay, yeah, that is, I learned that in school, and it's still helping me all these years later. Yeah, I mean, there, there's probably a bunch, but for time purposes, uh, the first thing that comes to mind was Israel Hicks, who unfortunately has passed, who, who was our, he was the head of, uh, of the program there, the, the acting program, um, has said, you know, said this great piece of advice I never forgot, which is always bring the day with you t- to, to work or to the audition or to the meeting. And it sounds sort of simple kind of, but because it's just sort of this acknowledgement that as you're in pursuit of a job or you are working on a job or a character or you are trying to get a job, you're making an impression, whatever, no matter what, life is just always happening and things are happening to you on the day of that performance or on the day of that audition or that meeting. And sometimes it's better to acknowledge whatever it is that's going on. Uh, The best example he had was you're on the subway, you're running late, you're trying to get to the audition and then someone bumps into you and you spill coffee on you and you're pissed off. And then you get to the audition and you're there to get the job, make the impression. Well, you might as well just own it and own the day and go in with it. And um, maybe something, at least then you're starting from a place of, from an honest place as opposed to maybe driving an agenda, so to speak, that you might've had the night before of how you were gonna do this particular scene or the impression you were gonna leave. Cause things just shift constantly. You don't have control over that. And, and that I feel like is really applicable always. For me, it was in terms of starting a new job or just going in the, the, the next morning to work on a scene with a partner. You, you make decisions, you make a plan, but then you have to just kind of stay open to everything that's coming at, at you, whether it's your own experience or what the other people are bringing, or maybe you, you didn't get a lot of sleep that night. So it, it's all sort of the more you acknowledge what the, what the actual truth is, then you're at ground zero and then you can actually start somewhere. Is that something that, uh, you know, that, that you realized when it was said to you, you're like, wow, that is super helpful. Or is that something that later on you through experience, you're like, Oh, that is true. Is it something you had to, that you learned and then had to a learn? Lot to of, experience? A lot of, yeah, well, that's the thing, because a lot of what I've learned in college was further cemented through experience. I think sometimes it's very difficult when you're when you're studying, when you're going to college, you're studying acting and you're 20, 19, 20, 21. You're learning a lot at a very fast pace. And it's only in application that sort of all that work kind of ends up sort of simmering down. And and. There are things that I learned at at Mason Gross um, that I think only made that made sense to me fully ten years later. And sometimes when you're younger, you're you're so obsessed with trying to get it right. And I think it's very difficult with this particular with with anything artistic or creative to kind of approach it from a right wrong result oriented kind of uh, approach because it can be very limiting. Because I I do think. Sometimes it's just sort of making yourself available for accidents, miracles, you sort of call them things you haven't planned that can give you a genuine response and elicit honest behavior, because then you're not just sort of driving an agenda into into the thing. You're just not open to anything happening in the moment. So, but to answer your question, I, I do think that's just something that gets better and better as you the older that you, you know, the older, the more experience that you have, at least for me. Yeah. And it, you know, you, you mentioned that the, the, the plan, the plan probably never quite works out the way you think it does. I, I'm curious when you, when you do you have sort of a, a, an acting origin story where you, the, your earliest memory where you're like, Oh, that's, that's acting. And like, that's what I would like to be doing. Yeah. Well, that was um, 
a lot of that was when I was in high school. Um, I remember I worked on um, Little Shop of Horrors was like the first thing I ever worked on. Yeah. And, and I just remember that experience of you're on stage and you're doing something and then you hear the audience respond to what you're doing and sort of, you know, you've made them laugh and then there's a reaction and there's this weird thing then that happens that immediate back and forth where you actually feel almost like a sixth sense that you have this, the audience's attention and, and they're paying attention to what you're doing. And it sort of influences you, your behavior, and then your behavior passes to them and they respond and you send back and, and like this cycle like is really very special and i and i just remember feeling that kind of on on that was when i was um i think a sophomore in high school or something and and feeling really fulfilled by it feeling really kind of in a sense being in some kind of dream state or something where you were present but not at the same time aware of all these other things and and I was like, oh, this, this is cool. This is this is addictive. <laughs> this is something I could do for uh, the rest of the rest of my life. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, but I didn't I didn't really know that then. You know, I, I was very lucky in a lot of ways because I went to a great theater camp, mm-hmm. Stage Door Manor, and that was a really big, big help for me because I met my manager there and I met kids that were in New York City who were going to performing art high schools, and I was able to come kind of going to the city every weekend and, and take acting classes. And then my manager was a huge piece of it because she wanted me to go to college. I mean, she encouraged me to get an education. And so I, so I, in a way I kind of thought, okay, well, it worked in high school. It's fun. So let me go and try it in college and then I'll see what happens then. And then I got to college and I was like, okay, well, this is fun. And then I booked my first job professional job which was the law and order thing and then i was like oh this is fun and then i moved to the city so i kind of only try to look at <laughs> what's the closest next thing rather mm-hmm. than you know this massive oh i have to i have to do this for the rest of my life i have to just i try to just kind of see as far as i could see rather than and and, and of course you're always romanticizing things but yeah i, I think that's the the trap even you know, when we talk about it, I don't want to, I don't want to say, you know, what was your, what were your dreams back then? What were you thinking? But I, I am curious, you know, at that point in your career, what is the, what's the the drive to get to the next thing? What is the, because, you know, there, there, there are hundreds of stories for every person who was successful as a person who was like, you know, what, not for me, you know, I, I won't go for the next audition. What is the, the early drive to get to that next place? I think it's interesting. I think you have to really pay attention to yourself. There are many times where, I mean, I, I was not, I didn't mind auditioning. I mean, I, I still have to, like, mm-hmm. it's not like it's done, but I didn't mind auditioning. Sometimes though, I look back at that early, those early years and I'm, I sometimes go, oh, it was, it felt a little simpler in a way because it was just getting, a, it was just about getting a job. It was mm-hmm. just, we were just trying to get something somewhere. It didn't matter what it was or who or where or what. And, and I think, as you get lucky and you and, and you work more and, and you explore certain things, you, it gets a little more specific. And each time you go, well, I, I don't want to keep doing that thing. I want to try and find something else that challenges mm-hmm. me. And then, and then that's a whole other headache. And, but, but in the early stages, I, I think it was just, um, well, look, I, I mean, like every typical actor, I grew up with movies and I mm-hmm. romanticized actors and scenes and movies and 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 I, I was I guess in a way always curious it, it felt it felt like an opening of a door in a way for me in terms of just I was born in Europe and I came mm-hmm. to America and I had to learn English and there was a lot of those years be- between 8 and 12 and 13 and 14 when I was 12 13 14 years old where I was learning how to communicate and relate to people and it was very difficult for me. And so in a way, acting and someone just giving you a scene and giving you lines felt like sort of this weird pass to kind of be allowed to sort of communicate. So in a way, if that makes sense, it, it, it was, yeah, absolutely. Um, there was, there was something about it that was like, Oh, I don't have to think about how to be, I could like, there's a scene telling you be this mm-hmm. way. And I was like, yeah. Oh, that, and for some reason that really felt natural to me or something. But, um, but I think, it's also that I just 
nothing else made sense to me. I, I never really had a plan B and stuff. And I know always people say have a plan B. And by the way, I don't know how you would do it today. I, I look at sort of mm -hmm. how it happens now. You've got online. I mean, I used to make VHS tapes in New York, literally like I would tape on a camcorder. Then I have to go to my manager's office, plug a cord. That's how old I am now, like into <laughs> her VCR, mm. put a VHS tape, transfer it off the camcorder, and then she'd have to FedEx my audition to LA. Like, I don't, now you have TikTok, you have YouTube, you have Instagram, you have all these other ways of kind of getting your work out there. I just, it, I wouldn't even know how to do it like now, but I guess back then it was, you know, it felt like every audition was an opportunity to, mm -hmm. whether you got the job or not, to, kind of keep going and 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 i didn't have it was like i don't know what else to do like this is the only thing that really feels good yeah i it's 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 interesting because you're right it, it's changed you know we even at backstage you know we were a magazine that was only in new york now we're talking to people on tiktok we're <laughs> everywhere yeah, yeah i yeah, always exactly. remember backstage i always remember i i remember leafing through backstage even before i even had representation i'd go to like the back like you know look at the casting notices and then i had to get the ross report remember that yeah absolutely the ross report had every single like agency and like agent casting director and i i remember my mom and i actually one took three days one time to put these headshots into these envelopes and we mailed them to each each casting office from from that ross report but backstage was a great one because you could that one you could actually even if you didn't have an agent you could kind of go straight to it mm -hmm. it's, it's funny because me and you we keep saying you know it's it's easy to romanticize it and this does it's, this is the romantic ideal of a, of a struggling actor in the beginning you know you're cutting out clips you're making vhs vhs tapes i'm curious did it feel romantic at the time or was it just pure work or were you like, wow, this is it. This is, this is what it is to be an actor. Yeah. I mean, I, it's so funny. I just read today on IMDb that Liz Sheridan died at 93. Do you know yeah. who that was? Sheridan Seinfeld's mom, most mm -hmm. notably but mm -hmm. Liz Sheridan had been around for a long time and she used to be a dancer and she wrote this book called Lizzie and Jimmy or Jimmy and Dizzy. I Dizzy and, 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 it's a book about her relationship with James Dean mm -hmm. in the fifties in New York city. Yeah. Sort of when, when he was unknown and, and she was struggling to be a dancer and he was going out on auditions. And I remember reading that book when I was like 17 or 18 and I was, this was before I got to Rutgers and I had a girlfriend who was at NYU and I would like, take the train and then go pick her up at like cap 21. And I'd be like, Oh, like, you know, this is what they did. I mean, so when I mean romantic, you know, sometimes romanticizing is, is I just, that book was so great. Cause it was, it was like, here's, here's about someone who was so famous or somebody who would catapult it so much, but then you got to see a little bit of as told through her eyes, the, the struggle and 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 I and for some reason I always ended up kind of drifting towards biographies and I would just pick up like anything I could on on actors and just so I could understand the struggle that they had and just to remember that the struggle is really a part of it I mean you're just sometimes you're really lucky you just knock it out of the park you know I mean I remember that story people people saying about the incredible Mark Ruffalo that he had gone on like a hundred auditions or something before he mm -hmm. booked his first job. I mean, that all that stuff, like, I think adds up to it. But for me, it would kind of give me strength because it would just sort of be like, okay, this is the way of the way. So you just rejection and saying, you know, hearing no and struggling and whatever, it's all part of the deal. Yeah. And it's funny because you know, you, you mentioned Mark Ruffalo and, and you 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 talk about his talent now and it's it's undeniable. People would say, of course, but but there are that there are there's a wake of a hundred people who were like, I don't see anything in that. It's it's it, you just it needs you just need that one foot in the door. It, 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 it's it's a yeah, and it's cliche and a lot of luck. There's a lot. What I've learned is a lot of luck, a lot of luck, and like a lot of the definition of luck, which somebody said, is preparation meets luck equals success or whatever or something. But it's about you're preparing yourself for this moment that may or yeah. may not happen, and then sort of hopefully when that moment happens then it goes well it's kind of like i don't know you, you you can't just wait for things to go right you have to be practicing in between the no's so, so when you get those yeses the yeses mean something 
I think the danger now is you have to be selective with who you want to compare yourself to. Comparing mm-hmm. yourself is inevitable. It's just inevitable. I think I think the social media world, for better or worse, has has sort of made it more difficult to be in the moment, but also to feel grateful with what you have. If you go down that rabbit hole, then nothing's ever good enough, no matter what you do or you have. So I, we didn't have that. I didn't have that growing up. And I was lucky about it because I think it's hard now. If you're a kid, if you're 15, you're 16, you want to be an actor and you're spending your time always looking at what everybody else is doing, trying to be like other people, trying to kind of conform, uh, then you're not going to find that path. You're not going to find the thing that's going to set you on your own because the thing that's going to set you on your own is to be different. And to be different means you have to find a way to not compare yourself or not try to please people or not try to do what everybody likes. And, 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 and that's a tough thing now, I think much more because we're just all so thrown together by social media, but, or if you are going to compare yourself, then pick your favorite actors or actresses and just kind of follow them in a way. Yeah. It's uh, it's hard. It's almost like it's hard to be, <laughs> to become an actor and to become a successful actor. It's hard, but at the same time, everybody's an actor now. Yeah, I mean, you know, what is I mean, what what is this? Yeah, like, like this conversation, talk, if not if not uh, well, a little bit of well, yes. I mean, of course, because we're I don't know. You could be like thinking about what you're going to be doing on Good Friday, <laughs> but, and you won't tell me that. Like, but yes, there's that. But I just mean also, I feel that there's so much you're putting content out there again, like you're mm-hmm. making a video, even though it's you. There's a degree of acting that, that, like there's almost so much acting happening. That's like we don't even know what what is good acting like or what yeah, is. Yeah. Acting. It, it, and and I think it's good and bad because on the on the one hand, I think it's good because you have a lot of opportunities now. There's a lot more. There's a lot more work. There's a lot more opportunities to be able to avenues to take from the streaming world to. And so that's the good part about it. It's always a pro and a con. Yeah, I guess the challenge is, you know, separating yourself from that noise. There's 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 a lot of noise. And so it's like the the, the goal becomes, OK, how do you how do you stand out from a this sort of tornado of content that there is just everywhere? Yeah. Or 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 staying curious enough and asking yourself, like, why are you even doing it to begin with? I think mm-hmm. that's an important kind of remind yourself if your why isn't big enough, you won't stick with it when you when you sort of look back on your career, the beginning, the middle, where you are now, years in the future, how has that why changed for you? When, how is it, how has your sort of driving force evolved over the years from, you mentioned, you know, in, in the early days, it was about getting a job. When did it become about more than getting a job? When did it become about more than that? I think, I think when you get to work and people, people see your work and then, and then you have, you're lucky to have interactions with people that have seen your work and and sometimes they're communicating to you how your work has impacted them for the better in Mm -hmm. a way or helped them realize something or helped them change something in their life or take a step towards something that they were afraid in taking or getting out of a toxic thing or whatever it may be then it sort of starts coming coming around um in a way and in a way that feels the most gratifying because at, at its, at its core, it's, it's really about communication. And, and that's what storytelling has always been since the get-go. And that's why we have to, I think, walk a fine line in terms of how critical we are of storytelling, because to some extent it is ingrown from when we were in caves, right. To paint on things like, and I might be biased here because like I said, when I came to this country, and I was learning English and I wasn't, I wasn't able to communicate as well as I wanted to. And, and, and some conversations I wished I had been lucky enough to have with my parents that I couldn't in a way, all of that sort of, I got a fix from the movies I was watching. I, I learned a lot about people from movies and I learned a lot about good and bad. And, and so I look at it as a, as a, as a, as a means of raising questions, sometimes uncomfortable but again, making us aware and trying to acknowledge that we're all not perfect people and we have flaws and, and human beings are capable of beautiful, incredible things and empathy, something that we cannot ever forget, but at the same time, serious destruction and incredible 
lack of like care about anyone else's well-being. And and so, and I think sometimes there's actually still in my head, I guess, something noble about this, because in a way that's that's how I look at it. The, the why for me became kind of I'm I'm just trying to kind of reflect truth around us, good and bad or whatever, and just just be part of the the conversation and the dissecting of what this is and what does it mean and and as long as what are we doing here like why are we making the choices that we're making and why are we deciding to be kind to this person and awful to this person and so and i think movies still manage to do that they don't always have to and sometimes it, it, can, it can also just be escapism in the form of which is which which is a hug of some sort mm. you don't always want to go to the movies to learn the biggest lesson of your life, but it's nice to have a choice. And then sometimes you want to go and go on a ride too. And that's okay too. And so I guess it's just about in a way um, being, you know, hopefully passing on some, some kind of being part of an education or of, of the self, but, but, but by that also passing it on to others. Yeah, there's that that Roger Ebert quote I love about how movies are um, empathy machines where, you know, you, you you get you sit there and then you're just in another life for 90 to two hours. You know, it's it's it's. Yeah, I mean, that, where else that's do you why get I, that? I know. And that's why I hope that we don't kind of dismiss the movie theater experience, because mm-hmm. especially now that we have phones and it's everywhere you're sitting at home. I mean, it takes great effort for you to put that phone away for two hours. Mm-hmm. I mean, sometimes I would have to set a timer and say, yeah. oh, the movie is two, two hours and 21 minutes. I'm going to start it now and I'm not going to look at it until I finish this movie. But that's a lot of work. Like, whereas in, sometimes in a theater where you're with other people because we're so, we so pick up on what everyone else is doing around us, you get to sit back and no one's on their phone. You're not going to be on your phone, you know? And then, then, and then you have that experience a little bit and you kind of go on that ride. But it's, if you're just at home always watching something and then you go back to your phone you pick it up you go back like you're breaking that train of thought you're not going to get what the thing's meant yeah. to give you and that's i mean that's something that i've i've had conversations with people who you know, they're not they're not very concerned with the craft of acting and i i try and tell them that if you're not looking at a performance you're you're missing so much of it because you know it's, it's so much of the performance is not just what you hear it's what the person is not saying it's what the person is uh, oh commuting. yeah you well know? yeah yeah and i mean and i think it depends i mean uh, movies have constantly been changing and that's one of the great things about it is sort of that it's a it's an evolving thing it's it's not just one defined thing but we should always look at kind of like all movies as as they as they've gone and what what have what can we take from them what have we learned from them and how are they evolving now and and i and i still believe that it doesn't matter how much technology there is if you're watching someone who's honestly experiencing something in that moment, your attention will be on them. To keep returning to the idea of romanticizing something, I think the movie theater experience is something that I, it's its kind of like second nature to me. You know, you talk about, yeah. it, you, you, you go into a movie theater and maybe, you know, the floors are sticky and people are like, oh, this is your, this is what you like to romanticize. But the idea of it, the fact that you said, you know, the screen is bigger than you and it's its sort of, you're, you're submitting to it is, is, that's a very romantic notion to me. And I, we, you do miss some of that when you watch a movie at home. There's just no denying that. It's true. But look, I mean, there's something nice sometimes about, you know, being... I mean, look, I've seen a lot of movies at home. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. Yeah, right? Look, I, I, I know. I know. And, and again, as soon as it looks like we're going that way, but uh, as soon as it becomes a little bit safer to do so, um, then I think I think we, should, we can't give that up. Um, but again, it there needs to be certain things about movies that, that want to bring you to that big experience. It's going to be different for everybody. I mean, if you're a movie buff, like you are myself, then we're going to go there for everything. But then there's certain people that are going to want to go, Oh, I want to go see, you know, a really Scott movie or whatever or something, because that's going to be an epic experience mm-hmm. that I, like the IMAX, the, there's a lot of things that can go into it. Right before this, I was reading the, the, the conversation, the printed conversation you were having with, Margot Robbie. Uh, I, I forget the publication, but it was a, you guys were in conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or something like that. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, 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 yes. 
Uh, you were mentioning that, you know, something that you think about when once you get to the physical part of the character is being self-conscious about, uh, I think the phrase you use is, is Sebastianisms, the, 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 the thing that, that make you you, which is in direct contrast to being a character. I'm, I'm curious about that because I, I think it's interesting that to, to morph into something else, you kind of have to unlearn what makes you you. And I'm, I'm curious how you start that process. I don't know. I mean, the thing is, I look at some of the most amazing actors in the world, right, of all time, Robert De Niro, Daniel Day-Lewis. I mean, I wonder if at some point Al Pacino, I mean, I wonder if sometimes there's only, and this is, I'm not speaking about them and saying this, but I just, mm -hmm. having watched so many of their incredible performances, I wonder if they have the, the awareness of that, that I'm questioning about myself, which is like, hey, at some point, how many different performances can you give mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. before there's just been so much of you that's been accessed or shared in various different ways that that it's ine inevitable that you're going to have certain kind of isms right in mm -hmm. a way um i do think it's there's i'm always seeking in a way to find again because i am very self-conscious of my <laughs> my my stuff <laughs> Of, of of breaking away from that but i i also can understand that i think to some extent you you won't there's certain things you just won't be able to do mm -hmm. you will be a version of you to some extent and it's not like you're gonna become an entirely different person it, it, it's I, I believe it was philip seymour hoffman that always talked about this i think he talked about it in the master when he was doing that movie the master it was just what you're kind of trying to do is you're trying to gravitate towards a certain essence and, and find a way to understand what you have in common with the character and what you don't have in common with the character. And I think once you figure out those two things, then you sort of go and you can accept that. Then you kind of start to see what you can work with and what you might have to study or, to, you know, go out there and research and, and figure out because it's just not part of your thing. There is, there are certain, roles where it could be easy to sort of just kind of do the same thing. Um, and then there's other things that kind of feel like real far, far swings. Mm -hmm. um, and, and those for me are always the more, now as I've gotten older, the more interesting stuff that kind of really terrifies me. And then I go, okay, I don't know anything about that. So I want to, I want to go and figure that out now in some way and it's that that curiosity that terrifies me but then really energizes me because i think fear is a big component of, of sort of sometimes jumping into something as opposed to i guess something you know reading a script where you go oh i know how to do this i can just mm -hmm. go to work tomorrow and do it now with my eyes closed so but the isms it it, it just depends on kind of like what those characters demand i mean i guess if you're playing a real person then there's already something that you have to kind of like figure your way towards if you're playing a fictional person then maybe you're inventing mannerisms or you're inventing certain things that may or may not help that that makes sense or but you're always kind of going to that ground zero like i said which is what do I have in common here? What what do I actually understand about what's going on? And what do I not understand? And and at least like knowing where what you have to work towards, I suppose. Where between, you know, action and cut, where does that part of you that is like, I don't know how to do this, this isn't me, where where does that go? Where do, how do you how do you sort of turn off the, the voice in your head that's a hundred percent you? Well, you never really, right? Like you never really, I mean, I think, I think, I think the best experiences that I've ever had were usually when like your gut and your head are connected. Mm -hmm. You can't walk into a scene only just emotional because then all you're seeing is just like erratic emotions. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe a character drifts more towards the emotion, like is more emotional than other characters. That's one thing, but you still have to, I think, have sort of this bird's eye view, of like a third eye kind of keeping watch of what's going on. That's also just being responsible. Because mm -hmm. um, I think there's nothing worse than seeing an actor just being like, 
I'm in the, I'm in the name, I'm in the character. I'm, it's me. And like, uh, you know, and like, and you're like, oh, you're just vomiting all over the place. Like, <laughs> Yeah, there is a there is a there's a degree of respect that we have to have when you walk in there to go, hey, like I'm going to go to toe to toe with you 100 percent. But we got each other like you're safe. I'm like, we're going to figure this out. Like, I don't I don't believe in creating chaos for the purposes of self, you know, kind of it, it translates. And I know actors do that a lot. You know, mm -hmm. there's a lot of people that do that create sort of chaos on set or chaos in the other people that they're working with in order to sort of somehow give the scene this tension or whatever. But to me, that just reads like a very irresponsible self narcissistic kind of um, self-indulgent thing. It, it just reads like, I'm afraid and I just want to torture everyone else because of it. But anyway, but I think it starts off way before action and way before it starts off before you get to set, you know, it starts off sometimes the night before. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was what I was, that's why I was trying to phrase it correctly. Cause I was like, I'm not suggesting that uh, you give, <laughs> you're just a vehicle for the character and you know, you're, you're gone. You're, I'm not, I don't want to verge into like, you know, philosophy, uh, sci-fi territory where I'm like, where do you go? I don't, I don't, yeah, do you I go? don't know because, because there's things like, for example, on stage, there are moments certainly when something happens and it's very seldom that you on stage, for example, because you can't, you can't yell cut and you can't get out of there. You can't walk out of there. It, it, it really does feel like you're just on this dream. You, you're, you're just in a dream. And somehow then two hours go by and you come out and you kind of go, what just happened? Or where did that really just happen? And there's sometimes when you go home at night from a long day and of shooting and you feel, you have that feeling too of sort of, wow, that went really well. But even the best nights on stage I've ever had, I always had another piece up here that was aware of the awareness that, you know, came with the character going, wow, this is like really working right now. This is, I'm, I'm getting a good instinct. I'm getting a, um, I think you need a degree of that, uh, even though you may have certain flashes or moments where you're just so in the moment that, that nothing else matters, you know? Yeah, all that all that character building stuff is so fascinating. And I think it's especially fascinating as I watch, you know, Pam and Tommy, in which you're playing a very real person. I think what I found really impressive about this performance, especially, is how you and this is interesting just for anyone who's playing a real person, how you picked up the quirks of a real person, that sort of the ticks of a real person, because you, you, by definition, someone's ticks aren't voluntary. So I, I'm curious how you how you go about learning someone else's involuntary actions well i think i think that that part of it feels a lot more like kind of learning a an instrument mm -hmm. in the sense you just have to keep practicing you have to willingly practice things in a, almost in a self-conscious way you're learning the piece of music to the degree that you're going to play without thinking about it and that I, I've only found in the in the in terms of Pam and Tommy, it was just there was so much. I would just keep listening over and over and over again to how he spoke in these recordings, and I keep watching, and then I'd walk around and just like almost hear hear him talk and try to talk with him as I was talking, and and you're just doing that over and over again all day long until like one day you're ordering a coffee and you realize you're like, Oh, you just, you just did the <laughs> yeah. thing. You just yeah. went into this thing and it came out of nowhere. It, you weren't aware of it. You weren't thinking because you can't, I think when you get aware of it, then, um, and, and you are, you are for a good portion. I mean, like I said, it's, it's a repetitive mechanical process that I feel is just, you, there's no fast way to get to it, at least for me. Mm -hmm. Unless I just try and repeat it and repeat it and repeat it and repeat it until I'm until I'm talking and I'm just doing things. It's just happening, you know. And by the way, we I don't know if you see this, but we do this naturally when we're so, when we're, the, we're, we're have you heard of being with a partner and mirroring? You know, you're, you're, you're around a certain person or you're with a buddy all the time or you're with a friend that you're constantly seeing every day. You actually start or I do, I start to like actually pick up yeah, yeah. Their, 
your thing. And, and so it's actually a very natural process. When you're playing someone, a fictional character, are you, are you essentially trying to mirror someone who's not there? Are you trying, are you trying to pick up the court? Do you have to sort of build the character in your mind and then, you know, step into that, their shoes? Well, you do. You, so you starts with the script. Everything starts with the script. I mean, mm-hmm. you kind of look at the actions of what the character actually does. And that's what you always ask yourself. It's not what they say. It's much more what they do. And then, and then I think you start to ask questions as to why they're doing the things that they're doing. Um, and again, we're talking about fictional characters now, not yeah, and, yeah, yeah. when you don't have the backstory and, and then you have to kind of create a backstory, but the backstory I'm going to be creating will be probably very different than the backstory you'll create because I have another set of things that will inspire me that will be very different than for you. You might be thinking of, I don't know, some song from 10th grade when you asked a girl out and she said no. And you remember that song. And every time you hear that song, it just puts you in that place where you were around 10 other kids who watched you get rejected by this person. And then that's what that song generates for you. And guess what? Playing that song before you do that scene actually is informing you in some way to go do the scene. I mean, it just depends because I guess what you're doing is, and this is where it gets fun, I think, is you're reading this script and you're going like, okay, what's the most, what's the most fun way? What's the most exciting way to play the scene? Exciting meaning what will, what will generate the most behavior in a way um, rather than me just walking on there. And, and then I guess you have to kind of, and this is all, by the way, Mason Gross. I mean, this is, <laughs> yeah. this is Mason Gross and this is Larry Moss, a, a, a teacher I've had for years who I credit every time as I should. And he's the greatest. And if anyone really wants to learn acting, you got to just buy his book, The Intent to Live. I mean, it's just, he spells it out clearer than I could ever say it, but it's, it's, it's finding the things that are meaningful to you and applying them in a way, even if they're very different from the script, you know, finding the right quality fabric of emotion or reaction that, that, that is applicable to what the, the, the script demands or asks for. And then, and then how you get there is sort of the fun. <laughs> so in that sense, when you're preparing to play Tommy Lee again, a real person are you sort of boiling the character of tommy lee down to you know a character sense and then you're playing your version of Tommy Lee because you don't you, I, I think that the goal is to not do just an imitation so are you essentially seeing what tommy lee the, the concept of tommy lee means as a character and then you're playing that or is it is it a i don't think time? when you're playing scenes you can really think of concepts it's almost too esoteric at that point i, mm-hmm. I think I think when you get down to a scene or a moment, it really has to be just about what is actually happening in the scene. What are you doing to the other partner? What is the other partner doing to you? What are what idea? I'm now I'm quoting Larry Moss 100. percent What ideas are you sending to the other character? I want you to have the idea that I'm that you should be terrified of me. I want you to have the idea that I that I would die if you left me. I want you to have the you know whatever. It's it's. Again, you have to go back to the script, but you can't at this point, at that point for me, it was really not even weirdly. If I went into every scene thinking of him as a real person that existed, I just would never have been able to do the job. Mm -hmm. I spent a month and a half, two months worrying every night about playing a real person until I got to set. And then I just said, it, you know, like what's there is going to be there. What isn't, isn't. And, and, um, and, and to some degree, I think if you, if you, if you allow yourself the time to, to prepare enough, then you will have enough confidence to sort of think that, okay, like I, some, I'm coming here with something, but, but I think in, in the case of Pam and Tommy, again, it's a marriage of things. The scripts were so great that the clues for where we needed to go were in the script, the dialogue, the beats, whether it's the at times the bravado or the vulnerability or sort of the frustration, the, all of that was in the script. And then I think what you do 
if it's a well-written script, like, like we had them, um, you're just spending months before you shoot. Cause to me, I think the most important time is always before you shoot. That's the trickiest time where you're least confident or all the demons are in your head or questioning things where you're trying things out, you're failing, then you're figuring out this works. It's like this weird, weird trial period. And then you basically arm yourself as much as you can with as much as you've learned about somebody, or if, if it's a non-fictional character, as much as you backstories you've created, as many memories or things you have vented about this person, that when you get there on that day, you will be inspired in that moment, in that scene, something will come through and it will come through naturally as opposed to you forcing it in there. This is fascinating how you build a character. I'm curious when it comes to the Marvel Cinematic Universe, which you have been in since, I believe, 2011, where you're not only building a character, you are coming back to a character repeatedly. Uh, I'm curious how that has affected you as an actor and affected your performance when you're like, okay, I'm, I'm, here's a character I built. Here, here he is two years down the line. Here he is three years down the line. You have to find new angles and stuff like that. Well, again, it's almost like it's just a bigger version of that first thing we started with, which is bring your day with you. In the, in the sense of 10 years, it's like you bring life with you. And when, you're, when you play the character for 10 years, as is the case here, it's inevitable that you will, the character will grow as you're growing. And I think you can see that with a lot of the characters in the Marvel world that they've shifted in certain ways as, as the actors have shifted as well. And that's something very unique. And I think it can actually land in such a more meaningful and impactful and profound way on an audience who has also grown up with the characters and the actors. It's like a weird symmetry kind of, which is why when you had those Avengers movies, it was so insane, but it, it was insane also not because they were incredibly well written, directed and produced and Kevin's unbelievable kind of brain holding it all together for years, but it was also just this lead up of 10 years of, of experiencing these people. Um, and I think, yeah, when you're, when you're going back to a character like that, I think you're, you do get, it is a little bit like riding a bike, meaning there's certain things that have always been there and you kind of, they've sort of solidified more and it's easy to jump in. And then you're going, oh, I'm in a point in my life where I've learned certain things. And then you, you just, you learn and see how you can apply that to the, to the characters in a way. And, and fortunately over there, it's been very collaborative. And I think that's that they've always welcomed us kind of bringing our lives to you know, in a sense of how we've grown up with the characters. Um, I think it's inevitable. You just get that from, from playing over time, the same, the same part. Yeah. I, I'm Look curious. At Indiana Jones. Look at Harrison Ford. I mean, filming it right now, I think. Uh, all yeah, these like, doing like, you know, you're like, he's giving you that look that you've seen for like 25 years, but in that look now is a man who has faced so many things. And so it's like, it's wild. Yeah, since that's sort of been, you know, you've done so much interesting work, like, you know, Pam and Tommy, Fresh, uh, all the way back to you know, Destroyer and I, Tanya. And then there's been the MCU, which is equally, equally, equally interesting work that's been the constant. And I'm curious, have you thought at all what it will mean for you, for your process artistically when, hypothetically, the, there is no more Bucky Barnes to go back to when, when you're not when you're not when you don't have him as the constant? Yeah, I, I have and I haven't. I mean, I, I, think, um, I think it will be weird for sure. Um, it is weird already. <laughs> um, uh, it's weird every time because every time it could be an ending in a way. And, um, and you treat it like an ending. And I think it's always going to be about what else is there to explore with that character. And, and they're more capable people than me that that can answer that and that can um but but that's not to say that i don't have certain things that i'd like to explore or certain things that i'd like to see more of and i still do feel like there's a lot left there to kind of still unpack um 
definitely had quite a journey so far, but absolutely. I mean, there'll be a time where I think might be too old to, <laughs> might be too old to, to do any of those stunts to begin with, but yeah, when that happens, it will happen. I mean, it was just, but I don't know. Harrison Ford is still playing. I was going to say Harrison Ford is putting the hat on as we speak. So <laughs> no, I don't know what that means. <laughs> Barnes, you know, you never know. Screwing the arm back on. Um, yeah, I, I I would love to to wrap this up. Um, going back to, you know, what you said about being in Mason Gross and then graduating and you know putting the the VHS tapes together and really just thinking about going from job to job. I'm curious when you look back on that. Uh, what is what is the advice from 2022 for that Sebastian Stan? What is the advice that you have for that period of your life? I, I would say just don't and I don't take things so personally. It's a really hard thing. I'm if I'm if you're asking me to tell that to my 20 year old self, that's what I would say. Um, don't take things so personally, and it's a very tricky thing because it's like your job as an actor is to understand what you take personally <laughs> you you're un, trying to understand yourself and you like my acting teacher at mason Groves, kevin kittle once said you know you guys should go home write these lists make a list of 10 things you love like absolutely love not not just like oh i love this movie I, it, like what do you love what do you hate what are you scared of what do you what pisses you off you know what because it's important. You have to know, you have to know yourself. And, and, and it's, that's why I think it's done right. This could be a, a great way of learning about oneself, but um, I would probably say, don't take things so personally. And, and so, and that's hard. Like, as I said, you're, you're always trying to figure things out, but, but if you don't get a job, it's not necessarily because you're a bad actor. It's not necessarily because you're not good looking enough or you're not weird looking enough or you're, by the way, it's always going to be something you're, even when you get the jobs, they're still going to go, I don't see it. Like you're, and you're like, <laughs> uh, it's like that movie Tootsie, you know, when he goes on there, Dustin on he's like, I can be, I can be this, I can be that. And you're like, I know what I can do. But then the other people like, don't, I had a, an amazing director the other day. He didn't say this to me. He told it to my agent. And huge guy, you know, pitching me for this one role. And, and he's like, yeah, but, Sebastian's like always like very confident, cool. You know, the guy who walks in the room and little does he know that I'm actually a very neurotic hypochondriac person <laughs> as well. But it's just, again, he, there's so much going into getting a job and not timing is a huge thing. Sometimes it is someone taking a shot on you. Sometimes it is about, they need to see you do it. Sometimes there's multiple amounts of money that has to go into the project that has nothing to do with you that falls apart and you didn't get the job. You know, it's not the universe necessarily. It's not. So I guess find a way to do this for yourself without taking it personally. <laughs> well, that makes sense. That makes perfect sense to me. Uh, that is unfortunately our time but this was a pleasure this 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 flew by and uh absolutely and, man thank you i enjoyed talking with you very very thoughtful questions i appreciate it of course of course and until next time thank you all right happy uh happy hol uh happy uh, easter happy weekend <laughs> happy friday happy whatever happy friday exactly happy life yeah right. absolutely thank you so much <laughs> thank you man all right bye Thanks, as always, to our brilliant producer, Jamie Muffet, and to the whole team at Backstage, Samantha Sherlock, Mark Stinson, Caitlin Watkins, and of course, Casey Howe. Visit Backstage.com, and don't forget, you can subscribe to Backstage with code ENVELOPE at checkout for a free trial. 100% free, you simply cannot beat that. For more exclusive content, find us on Facebook and Twitter at In the Envelope, and subscribe, share, and leave a comment. Who should we interview next? Let us know. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time for another peek in the envelope.